thanks for joining us again. Okay. Uh, um, tell us who you are and how you are associated with the B-58. Well, my name is uh, Ken Smith and uh, I was a pilot in the B-58. That was it. <laughs> what, uh, what years were you uh, a B-58 pilot? Uh, from about June of 63 to April of 69. Long time. Yeah. Uh, where were you based? Little Rock in Carswell. Okay. Did you go to training in Carswell? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, tell us why the B-58 is important to you. Well, it was uh, the airplane back in the 60s as far as uh, speed and uh, setting records and things of that nature. Uh, it's kind of funny nowadays, uh, like a 10-year-old kid, probably about 90% of the 10-year-old kids have all heard about the SR-71 Blackbird, and I bet you uh, 10 percent of them have never heard of the B-58 Hustler, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a shame in a way because uh, the uh, Hustler really never got its publicity as far as uh, throughout the country other than back in the 1960s when it was actually setting the speed records and stuff, then, then everybody heard about it, but uh, it seemed like everything was top secret about it, so they didn't... Uh, pass out too much information on, on it or anything. And, uh, but it was quite an airplane, especially uh, final approach speed. It probably had, I think, the F-100 uh, without the flaps uh, was similar as far as down, coming down final at 200 knots and, and or 200 plus knots. I think the highest speed I ever flew was uh, 222 knots down final. <laughs> and uh, things were really whipping by. Uh, I was, it was probably my own fault. I, it was a nice day and I was practicing touch and goes and I, you're supposed to land when you get down to 10,000 pounds of fuel and I, I was sitting around 10,000 I thought, well, let's do one more final approach here. And, and just as I took out, did the touch and go and came around on a uh, base, or on a, a downwind leg, uh, the uh, traffic pattern just filled up with airplanes and holy mackerel, I ended up about way over 10 mi a 10 mile final approach with the gear down and everything and uh, uh, coming in and it was a nice uh, sunny day so it wasn't any, weather wasn't a, a factor but uh, anyways uh, as, a, as you get below 10,000 pounds of fuel the CG starts moving forward and then for each 1% uh, forward of, uh, I forget, 20, 21% MAC or whatever, you had to add two and a half knots airspeed. <clears throat> and um, that's why I ended up with so much uh, airspeed on final approach there. <laughs> and, uh, but it, fortunately it turned out okay. <laughs> and, uh, Did you have any trouble seeing out of the airplane when you landed? No. Uh, well. A little bit as you just rounding out, I think the nose got up to, what was it, 15% uh, or so, uh, uh, and uh, then you'd lose a little bit, you'd, you'd see off to the side, but the uh, TB was the one that was really bad. You, as an instructor, you sat in the second seat and uh, and you couldn't see anything down there. <laughs> it was really hard to see. What was your first flight in the airplane like? Hmm. I don't know if I remember it. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, it was in a TB TB58, and uh, oh, it was non-eventful. I I don't recall too much about it. Mm. Uh, just another flight, so yeah. so to speak. <laughs> how how did uh, the airplane affect uh, wh what what other airplanes you got to fly later? What happened? What happened after the? B-58. Oh, I went to uh, Vietnam in the F-4. Uh-huh. And uh, at the Nang. How, what, uh, what left an impression on you about the B-58? Well, they were, um, I guess, similar in airspeed, of course. Uh, the F-4 was a Mach 2 airplane also, but uh, 
we never flew it at Mach 2, uh, whereas in B-58, we, all, we f flew quite a, a lot of training missions in, at Mach 2. And the uh, F-4, we hardly, we had, I think, one training flight where we actually went Mach 2, and the rest of it was all mostly subsonic. And uh, so uh, the one thing I liked about the B-58 was it had a, a control stick instead of a, a yoke. And uh, I had flown mostly fighters and trainers and single-engine, dual in, uh, twin-engine airplanes. Prior to uh, B-58, of course, I was in a B-47 with six engines, but uh, uh, I liked the con control stick instead of the yoke. Uh, and, uh, and of course, one nice thing about the 58, it had the, the escape capsule, which was really nice in that when you walked out to the airplane, you didn't have to carry a big old uh, parachute with you across a across a ramp. Uh, with parachutes were kind of heavy. I don't know what they weighed, 30 or 40 pounds maybe. And uh, with the B-58, you just walked out there in your flight suit and in your bag and, and uh, hopped in. And it was a real comfortable seat, uh, padded and uh, Nice color, it was red. <laughs> and uh, the, the cockpit looks like it was really nicely designed. Did that leave any impression on you? Yeah, they had it, uh, all the engine instruments were on the right uh, side of the, uh, the front of the cockpit, and, uh, and the flight instruments were on the left and uh, in the center. And fuel system was over to the right, and uh, so it was. Uh, Pretty well laid out. And, yeah, it, was, it was a nice airplane to fly. What's uh, what, what do you think the importance is of bringing this airplane to Fort Worth? Well, they definitely should have it. I'm surprised there's so many. I mean, not, there's not many of them, but uh, all the ones that they have are spaced out throughout the country instead of uh, where they were built, right here in the Fort Worth. And uh, they definitely should have one here. Just, uh, just like the Air Force Museum has one, and they, they should have one, and we should have one here. <laughs> so I uh, yeah. hope they get it. <clears throat> what else we, would you like to say about the airplane? What, what, uh, what, what kind of missions did you fly when you were uh, on alert and doing those sorts of things? Well, we. Unfortunately, pulled a lot of alert alert duty. Uh, we we were always short of pilots. Uh, seems like they'd have I don't know what six or eight pilots in a class, and two or three of them would wash out because they couldn't uh, couldn't hack the program. The, the the high speed on landing and stuff like that. They so they uh, they would, so they might start a class of eight, and uh, only five would graduate. So. And we'd end up being short, and when we were short, we had to pull what was known as back-to-back -back alerts. You'd, fly, you'd uh, pull alert for a week in the, in the bullpen at the end of the runway, and then uh, you'd spend your entire time there, uh, leave your family, and uh, wouldn't see the kids for a week later, or a wife. And then, uh, oh, uh, you'd get out like on Friday, then you'd have the next week off of alert, but you'd usually fly a usually one mission uh, in uh, training mission in a, in between, and then the following Friday you'd go back on alert for another week, and uh, that got pretty old after a while. But uh, well, uh, it was uh, I I remember one uh, mission uh, we flew. It was a air defense exercise and we took off, I don't know, uh, 10 o'clock at night or so and flew from Little Rock up to San Francisco, went uh, about 400 miles west of San Francisco and then turned south and then we refueled uh, on the southbound leg and then we got uh, about 400 miles west of uh, Los Angeles and uh, kicked it into afterburner and accelerated to Mach 2 and we uh, we were at Mach, I was at Mach 2 for 20 minutes, which is a pretty long time at that speed, and the old fuel was really going down. But uh, anyways, 
Uh, it took uh, 20 minutes to fly that 400 miles at uh, 20 miles a minute. <laughs> and uh, so it was uh, a lot of fun. I, I remember one time I went down to Waco to pick up uh, an airplane that had been, they, they were working on our airplanes down there. And this one they just finished, and so uh, I was heading back to Little Rock. It was a nice, uh, clear day, and so I took off and I asked the tower, uh, "How about a high-speed pass?" And, okay, so I went south of the airport, and I'd, I'd gotten clearance from center up to 33,000 feet, I guess it was, and so uh, came over to the airport about uh, 600 knots and about a thousand feet above the ground. Then I pulled it on up and kicked it in the afterburner. And, Got up to 33,000 feet, and I called center. I said, uh, "Umpty ump two five, uh, level at uh, flight level three three zero." The guy said, "What? What are you doing? You didn't tell me you're going to fly uh, go up an afterburner. We got airliners up there and everything." And I had a nice clear day. I didn't see any airliners, so <laughs> but uh, they weren't too happy about it. And I, I didn't tell them that I was going to climb an afterburner. <laughs> It, uh, Did uh, you have any <coughs> visits to the plant where these were built in, here yeah. in Fort Worth? Uh, another time I was at Fort, uh, Little Rock and uh, went down to Fort Worth to pick up an airplane. And we, uh, no, I guess we took the airplane there. We landed and one of the vice presidents uh, met us at the airplane and he introduced himself and he, uh, they were just building the F, FB-111. and. Uh, they, he, um, they had number 17 was on the, on the line of just being built, and they, he took us over and showed us number five that uh, it was sitting on a ramp. And we uh, got to walk around it and look at it and so forth. And then he uh, took us up to the executive rest, uh, dining room and we had lunch up there he bought for us. And so it was uh, pretty nice, yeah. So I got, got there once. <laughs> Very good. Well, anything else you want to add? No, it's uh, it's just uh, unfortunate that it's, it uh, didn't get much publicity. Like it's it's such a great airplane. It's probably still uh, as fast as the fastest ones now. I mean, I don't know how fast the B1 is, but uh, it's a, it's a Mach 2 airplane also. But uh, other than that, even the fighters uh, like the F-15, of course, is and. Uh, I guess F-14 was, and but uh, F-16 I don't think can go Mach 2, and uh, F-35 I'm not sure I don't think it can go Mach 2 either. Does does it uh, still? Is it does it impress you that we could build an airplane like that so many years ago? Yeah, so many years ago that was really uh, amazing. Not sh not very uh, much time, much time after World War II ended, and uh, jets were just coming into the into the program and here all of a sudden we got a, a one that'll go twice the speed of sound. It's really quite impressive uh, for that time of, of history. <laughs> uh, all right. What was the maximum altitude? Well, I, I think it was about 63,000 feet, but uh, we were, all our training missions were 50,000. We, uh, I always had to level off at 50,000 uh, just because there wasn't any reason to go up an additional 13,000 feet or so. So it's, uh, we just, all training missions were, were at 50,000 feet. And, uh, and of course it set the absolute re altitude record at the time of uh, zooming up in 84,000 feet or something I think it was. It'll be 58? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was, uh, I believe it was 84,000, some couple hundred feet over, and uh, but it was a ride. Yeah, mm. it's probably, probably running out of airspeed as he topped out, but uh, yeah, it was that was an altitude record at the time. I think the SR-71 beat that, but uh, so. Well, we appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Well, thank you for inviting me in, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, appreciate your help in help trying to get this airplane back to Fort Worth. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.